Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, on this blessed Sunday, make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and clear consciences. With all the children of your holy church, we glorify and thank you your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Peace be with the Church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples and gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion and what voice can bless you for you are above all praise. Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now, O Christ, our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense which we offer you to forgive our sins and give peace of mind to those in distress and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherds, sanctify the priests, and purify the deacons. Pardon all sinners and guard the righteous. Protect orphans and help widows. Drive away all conflicts and put an end to dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. We raise glory to you, to your blessed Father, and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
O Lord, accept the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with all the angels to proclaim it with your women disciples and to rejoice in it with your pure apostles. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Kadishat Aloha Kadishat Shout with joy from the mountain, Sunday is a fee so great. Offer praise to the Lord God, and with angels celebrate. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, now in regard to spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be unaware. You know how when you were pagans, you were constantly attracted and led away to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be anathema. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different forms of service, but the same Lord. There are different workings, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. To each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for some benefit. To one is given through the Spirit the expression of wisdom. To another, the expression of knowledge according to the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another mighty deeds, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another varieties of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. 
but one and the same Spirit produces all of these, distributing them individually to each person as He wishes. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one Spirit. Now the body is not a single part, but many. If a foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it does not, for this reason, belong any less to the body. Praise be to God always. Alleluia, alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Alleluia. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation and life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle Matthew writes, Then they brought to Jesus a demoniac who was blind and mute. He cured the mute, the mute man so that he could speak and see. And all the crowd was astounded, and they said, Could this perhaps be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man drives out demons only by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself shall be laid waste, and no town or house divided against itself shall stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? But if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your own dis disciples drive them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can anyone enter a strong man's house and remove his property unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. 
Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is the truth, peace be with you. For in one spirit we were baptized into one body. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Lord is entirely God and entirely man. That's the basic definition of the reality of the Incarnation. Now on Friday we had celebrated the feast of the 350 martyrs, disciples of St. Mary which is essentially the birthday of Beit Marun. And we had a nice attendance. It was quite lovely done. It was beautifully sung. But what the whole argument and why these men are martyred is because in the fifth century, the whole argument about was who is Christ? Is he completely God and completely man, partially God, partially man, somewhat in between, one nature, two natures, all of this? But of course, the reality of the apostolic faith is that our Lord is entirely God and entirely man. After that, you have all kinds of philosophical vocabulary words being used, but that's the basic reality. And it's always important to remember because the church is that extension of Christ in time and space, which means that the church will always have all of the aspects of that individual, the Savior, who was entirely God and entirely man. She will be there on the last day when our Lord returns. How big, we don't know. But the church will endure until the end of time. But it also has all of the frailties of human nature. After, Lord, after all, that man who was the Son of God was put to death on Calvary. He was hungry, thirsty, tired, could be beaten and bleeding. And that reality is also very much part of the church. That human frailty, those human shortcomings, they will always also be part of the church. We would like everyone to be transcendently holy. You would like all of the priests to be transcendently holy. I can tell you the priests would love it if all the faithful were transcendently holy. It would be a lot easier to guide and to teach. But the reality has this kind of paradox always, and every generation plays it out in a different way, because every generation has its own troubles and its own turmoils and its own historical problems. Now I told you last week we would talk a bit about the units of stage, where we're supposed to all be moving toward in the Christian life and what that Catholic spirituality is meant to be. But I think we're actually going to reserve that for next week. Because next week we will do the solemnity of the Transfiguration. The Transfiguration is on August 6th. So this year it's this coming Thursday. But we will also repeat it on, just to solemnize it on Sunday. And for the Eastern churches, the transfiguration is central. For the Byzantines, they celebrated twice in a year, on August 6th, and they also celebrated during, I think, Lent. And certainly in the old Latin calendar, it was celebrated on the second Sunday of Lent. So the transfiguration is very central because it's a moment in which that human nature of our Lord radiated 
the transcendent light, not that they saw divinity, but a glory was manifested that belongs, that is meant to belong to each human being through their baptism. We were baptized together in one spirit into one body. And we ourselves limp along year after year in that same kind of paradox. Moments when grace elevates us up and then moments when human nature just plows us into the dirt. Up and down, up and down. And we try to arrive at that equilibrium. And that's been the last weeks talking about the beginner stage and the stage of proficiency as they move. The proficiency is to come so that there becomes an equilibrium, not a plateau, because we're always moving forward, but an equilibrium to find the stability of mastery of our senses, etc., and our correspondence to grace. So all I wanted to leave you, all I wanted to give you this week is we've talked about faith. And I've talked about the two stages that we talk about the dark nights. And that the grace that's given to us as St. John of the Cross says is a dark fire. But it is precisely that faith, that proportionate means that we spoke about last week that joins us to God. And without that proportionate means, we have no access to God, which is why St. Paul says very bluntly in the scriptures, in his letters, without faith, it is impossible to please God because the faith is what plugs us in, so to speak. It's what gives us that connection to the divinity. So what is happening when we talk about having the faith, receiving the faith, living the faith? What does it actually mean? We talk about it in a modern world like it's just either an emotional oomph I get because I get to go see people I like you know, basically once a week, which is not faith at all, it's a social gathering at the Qantas Club. That's fine, but don't call it supernatural faith. But faith, because we live in a Protestant country, we often think like Protestants. And for the Protestants, faith is primarily confidence, trust in the Lord, trust in Jesus, no matter what happens. If I've been born again, no matter what happens, everything comes crashing down, I am still saved because I have that confidence. There is an aspect to that of being true, but that is not what the faith is either. And there are moments, especially in the dark nights, in which you will have fee nothing of an experience of any kind of confidence in God in the midst of darkness. But the faith is not necessarily gone. The faith is the unfolding of revelation within the personal spirit of each individual who receives the grace of faith. It's an unfolding and a revelation, not personal revelation like Luther said, because again, it's within the structure of the visible body of Christ. In one spirit, we were baptized into one body. The unfolding of the faith for the individual person is an unfolding revelation to the individual within their mind, within that visible body of the church, which is Christ. So you have to balance out both. When I say that the act of faith, the gift being given to us, is an unfolding and revelation of God to the spirit of that individual, it's not making it up on your own. It's within the visible body of Christ. That invisible grace functions within the visible body of Christ. And that's why we say outside the church there is no salvation. It's a logic that flows from it. It's not the exclusivity of a club. It is the extension of the reality that there is only one plan of salvation and one savior. So when we speak about the faith, it's this unfolding. Because it is a participation in the divine intellect, when we talk about the theological virtues, faith, hope, charity, faith gives that individual not just simply a light which is placed within their spirit, but it is a participation in the divine intellect, here and now. And that's why the theologians will say that between the act of faith and the beatific vision of heaven, they are essentially the same. It's just a change in state when we die. That's how important the faith is and how essential it is to find that healing that we call salvation. It is not an option. 
And when we speak about charity, charity is the participation in the divine will of who God is, of infinite charity, infinite love. And hope, hope is that security we have to hang on to that faith and charity to the bitter end. But faith, and ho faith, hope, and charity, are we call them theological virtues because they are the things that plug us directly into theos, into God. The other virtues we call moral virtues. They're the way we act. They're the way we do things. They're the way we think. But faith, hope, and charity are absolutely essential to touch the divinity. So it is a gift. It is not dependent upon my parents. It is not dependent upon my personal sense experience. It's not on any kind of logical argument. It is a gift. And it is something which is given to us which is beyond all other human activity. Sometimes we think, well, she's such a good lady. She makes brownies for the children down the street. Certainly she's going to go to heaven. It's like, well, what's, is she plugged in? Is there a theological reality in her life? No, but she's such a nice lady. Well, that's great. Give her a gift from the Rotary Club for being such a conscientious citizen. But that is not being touching divinity. St. Paul, outside of Damascus, on his way to arrest the Jews who were following the way, following the gospel, he was not disposed in any way whatsoever to the faith. He hated it. And yet God just backhanded him off that horse outside the city, blinded him for days, and brought him in the one spirit through baptism into the one body. Faith is not dependent upon anything human in our world. It's why you may have parents who have no religion. It's why you may have spouses who have no religion. It may be why you have children who have no religion. It may be why you have parents. All of it, every individual is to be touched and to have the unfolding of this intimate revelation of God within them. It is a profound mystery. It touches areas of the human existence that not even the angels or the devil can touch. How profoundly personal they are. So it is a gift. And it's the reason why we have this struggle as we grow up. When we're little, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, our faith is our parents' faith. We just do what they tell us. They drag us along the church, they throw us in the pew, we go. Usually we're hopefully bribed with pancakes or donuts or something after. So that kind of encourages me to be dragged along. And then we reach puberty. All of a sudden now it's adolescence, when I have to start becoming my own individual person, not just being dragged along. We've done this really badly the last 30 years, which is why you, have, you know, so many people have 45-year-olds who are still living in their house, their children. But in the normal situation, those are the years in which we're trying to get our feet on the ground, and it's not easy. It's thrilling when you're in it, but no adult would ever say, oh, make me 15 again. No, no, no. If you did, that just means your life was pretty much in the past. You were the boopsie cheerleader, and that was the pinnacle of your life at 16, and now you're probably living someplace addicted to something. Now, it is exactly for that same reason that the faith becomes unstable for children the same way the instability comes in adolescence. Because that faith that when I made being dragged along, it's now the faith that has to become mine. How many parents over the last three decades I have weeping and gnashing of teeth? <gasps> My child went off to university and she lost the faith. No, she probably had lost it before that. It's just now she can act on that. It's a very mysterious point that takes place. I used to, I used to work in Geneva, Switzerland. And parts of Switzerland, they actually still keep the faith pretty well. At least 20 years ago, they did. And their children would go off to the University of Geneva, the city of Calvin. And of course, their kids oftentimes just lose the faith. And it was very frustrating because these Catholics in the interior part of Switzerland would say they went to Geneva and they lost the faith. Well, I'm working in a parish in Geneva and there are hundreds of people that come to this parish. 
Geneva doesn't poison you and you fall over dead supernaturally. And so it's the same thing. It's that adolescent period in which we wrestle with, is this the revelation that I embrace? Is this going to become my reality? And that's why the faith is so intimate to the individual. And sometimes, depending on what you gave them in the first 10 years of education in the faith, they'll be fine, or you've lost them by 16, and you're not gonna be able to bring it back, except through prayer and fasting and praying for miracles. At some point in the future of their adult life, they convert. And that's why those first 10 years are of essential and vital importance that we give a sense of identity with the faith, not just an identity with donuts and pancakes after mass. Nothing wrong with pancakes, I like them, they're great. But it's so much more profound, this question of identity. But again, it's the reason. So I, all of this is to bring you to the idea of what is the dark night. The dark night of the spirit is the second stage that will bring you into the unitive stage. And it is a period where the faith, that unfolding of God's revelation within the spirit, that theological faith, becomes more and more unfolded. And becoming more and more unfolded actually becomes more and more brilliant, more and more light. But we're not able to receive all of that light. It's why the theologians will talk of it as taking, taking a bat, taking an owl, and shoving them out in the middle of the noonday sun. And they flop all over the place. They can't see a thing. They're totally blind, completely disoriented. That is the dark night of the spirit. The individual comes to a point in their life where they have been so profoundly faithful and corresponding to grace that God can, humanly speaking, say, all right, here we go. And he pulls this person further into the light, unfolding that revelation within their spirit, and they scream because they're blinded by it. They're blinded by it. There's nothing wrong with the noonday sun. It's just that the owl is not adequate with its eyes to be able to see within that sun. So it is blinded. It is the same way our spirits need to be amplified and extended, so to speak, humanly. And being pulled into that light deeper and deeper with that brilliance, it causes blindness. This is why St. John of the Cross calls it dark fire. And the darkness is why we call it dark, but in fact, as you understand, it's not dark at all. It's brilliant, but brilliant beyond my little puny eyes can see, my little bat eyes. Yeah, the other day I had a bat in the rectory, so that's just part of my head. The poor little thing, when I threw him outside, he flopped on the ground. I figured he was probably dead, but he was gone later on. They're indestructible, aren't they? But of course, those little puny eyes, that bat in the middle of the day, or in the morning, what it was, in the middle of the sun, of course, was probably disoriented, even from the point of view of what it normally guides itself by is its radar, right? Its, echoes, its echolocation system. And so because it's so blinded in one faculty, it's not even able to respond to the echo. This is what happens in the dark night. Everything becomes disorienting. But the person is not becoming worse, they're becoming better. They're becoming more godlike. This is what every single one of us is supposed to go through at some point in their life. Not anxiety and stress, but a transfiguration by light. And so when we build up to it, we build those fidelities through the years of our life, that struggles of adolescence and all these things. But ultimately what God is bringing us to is this faith which is a dark light, which is transformative. And so it's development, and this is what I leave you with, it's development has to be freed from senses. It has, it has to be freed from emotions. It has to be freed from every aspect of my frail human existence so that God can be God within my life. Now fortunately the dark night ends and you enter into the unitive state. That we'll talk about in conjunction with the transfiguration next week. 
But to understand what the mortification, why you fast and why we have Dormition fast and fast for the apostles and great lens before Christmas and Easter, because we're training ourselves to detach ourselves from those senses. I like this, I like that. Well, you learn how to become vegan for a week. You learn how to become, and it isn't about pain. It isn't about giving something up because I like cookies. You can have cookies, they're vegan. Well, some of them are. You can have these things, but what the fasting in the Eastern Church is training is the will. How I choose, what I do. This day will be this kind of food during these hours that I will eat. It's not about afflicting myself. It's about training myself. So when that light becomes brilliant in my light, I can let go of all of those human orientations and allow God to work. This is how all of the saints were made saints. At some point in their life, early or late, God blinded them by the brilliance of this light, figuratively as we see externally done to St. Paul. So because we have to free ourselves from that senses, from the feelings, from imagination, we call it the dark night of the spirit. But I leave you with one practical conclusion. St. John of the Cross will also talk about this, as the theologians do. But he says that if the faith, if the faith does not depend upon anything in my life to be given, I receive it. I have the faith. I receive the faith. It is a gift. If that is true, then it's not dependent upon me making brownies. That's the first thing or paying my taxes, or stopping to a full stop at a stop sign. It is something transcendent. But St. John takes it to the next thing. If the faith's unveiling within me is not dependent upon my sense experience, upon my imagination, upon my feelings, my hugs at church, whatever. If the faith is much more profound than that, then he says that it is going to be a path which is not only dark, but it is going to be in the darkness that we find our greatest security. So that if we want to live life, the faith to its fullest, not only are we detaching ourselves, that's the dark path, from sense, hanging on to sense, hanging on to imagination, hanging on to emotions, that not only are we doing that by walking on the dark path, it's by purposely detaching ourselves for those things. He says our greatest security in the faith is when we're no longer dependent upon sense, when we are no longer dependent upon emotions. We will still be in the pew, even if we hate the priest. We will still be in the pew, even if we hate the woman three pews behind me. We will still be there because it is the revelation of God. St. John is saying that it is detaching from all of these things that ultimately on this dark path, and that's the conclusion, that if it's the security within the darkness, then we are most secure when we walk on that dark path with our eyes closed. You simply plunge into the dark fire for the purifications of the mind and the spirit, the will, and that will introduce you into transfiguration. So may we see you on Thursday for the feast, and if not, we'll see you next Sunday into the unity stage of what God desires to do at the end of that dark path into the brilliance of the light of the Sacred Heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Telvot madem heid aloho, valvot aloho dam chade taliunt. Wein absevot aivot aha feyul al baytov meskudam chayek lo. Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings which your children have brought to you, their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. We remember the Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and His plan of salvation for us. We recall upon this offering all those who have pleased us from pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
Continue with the anaphora of St. Peter, Chief of the Apostles, on page 774. 774. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Father, God of peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. blessings and assistance for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all we raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever Amen. O lord may the light of your face shine upon us deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly, it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O Maker of all creation. With the angels, we glorify you, and with voices of praise. We cry out and we proclaim.
O God, the Father, and abundant in mercy. Because of your love for us, you sent your Son into the world, and he became flesh of the Virgin Mary, O our salvation. Kiri Eileen said, Wabiyama haudoktum harsha dilema bidhaye, and sabe lachma mino kodishoto, O Barach O Kadesh, Waksoya Biltal Mita O Kadomara, Sabach Ulam Mehne Kulfu, Hono Denita, Bachro Odil, Bachlo Faikun, Wachlo Sagiye. Metapaseo meti hem, Hosoyan, Homewa hoyan, and Alam Alami. O Kano Alcoso, Damsi, O men Hamro, O men Mayo. Barach o Kadesh, Yabil Talmida o Karomara, Sabishta o Mehne Kulhu, Honon Denita, Gemoho Dilan Diyati Ki Khadato, Dachlof Paikun Wachlof Sagiye, Eter shedu meti hem, Hosoyan, Home wa hoyan, Alam, Alami. He then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest Lord, we remember your coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you, on the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your holy face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you, Employs your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed body and soul, 
from every sin and receive eternal life. O Lord, accept our intercessions and prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church so that they may intercede, to, intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. parents, brothers and sisters, teachers and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was in
God the Father, you strengthen and encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering, so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven. not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive their sins, for you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity, one Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth, to give Him glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your Holy Body, and our souls purified. Thank you. 
We thank you, O oh Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your life-giving cross. Be their shelter and refuge, and perfect them with your abundant blessings that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.